It's been said that every quilt tells a story, and it's so true. But I also believe every quilter has a story to tell. I wanted to hear about the people behind these wonderful quilts and thought you'd enjoy hearing about their lives also. Welcome to A Quilter's Life. It was fun to talk to Stephen Cook just before Guthrie and I took a trip to Alaska, since that is where Stephen lives. I love the quilting tip that Stephen shares. It's one that I hadn't heard before and can be so useful. Stephen, thank you so much for joining me on A Quilter's Life. I saw on Facebook a post that you put in another group I'm in, in a cross-stitch group, a wonderful cross-stitch you did in a maple leaf of a camping-type scene. And you just did a beautiful job with that. And then I saw that you're a quilter. So I just had to connect with you. And I wanted to thank you so much for being interviewed on A Quilter's Life. Thank you. My pleasure. It's fun to meet different people from around and uh, get feedback on my craft. Mm -hmm. Let's start with where were you born and raised? I'm originally from mid-Michigan pretty much right in the center. And, and later on, we moved up to the northwest part of the Lower Peninsula before I changed careers and uh, moved out of state. So you were there for your whole childhood? Right. I lived in Michigan until about the age of 28. I'd been through college for the Maritime Academy, and then I had went back and finished my business degree and worked briefly for the FDIC. And then I went back to school for my teaching certificate and did a year of adult ed. And then one of my former principals had moved to Alaska and was back in the state doing interviews. And I interviewed and got a job sight unseen to a small Eskimo village way out on the Yukon Delta, almost to the Bering Sea. And I was there for seven years before I moved into the Anchorage area and finished out my career teaching at, in Palmer High School. I want to jump back just a minute. Did you have a special childhood memory? I think what really sticks with me is my grandma and grandpa's soul. We spent a lot of time at their house at the lake pretty much almost every weekend during the summer, holidays, and so forth. And they were just real special grandparents. And that was just where I learned a whole lot of my crafting as well as my mom. But it was just family times with them was just really super special. When I think of a lake, I'm thinking boating and swimming. Did it incorporate both of those or was it just swimming? It was mostly swimming. Grandpa and Grandma didn't have a power boat by that time, although Dad would sometimes bring his small aluminum boat. But it was mostly just jumping off the dock and swimming and being in and out of the water all day long. Always lots of fun. Well, it sounded like you had a lot of different employments. I was curious, we're always seeing FDIC. The bank has FDIC, but I guess it never struck me that someone actually had to work for the FDIC. Right. It was kind of an interesting period of time. I'd went to the Maritime Academy from 79 to 82 and graduated right in the middle of the recession in 82. And there were no jobs on the ships on the Great Lakes. So I was never able to use my license. Then I went back, like I said, and finished my business degree. and. Banks had started to fail during that downturn. And we had a local bank in town fail. And they were looking for people to help liquidate certain assets. And a friend of ours was working for them and mentioned my name to the boss. And he mentioned it to dad. And I called for an interview and ended up getting a job there with them to help liquidate certain assets and also had the opportunity to travel to Iowa to two small communities to help close, unfortunately, and liquidate some banks there as well. 
Wow. Yeah, during those times, it is a necessary job that needs done. So thanks for doing that. And then you mentioned working with Eskimos. Is that correct? Right. After I went back to school, after the temporary job with FDIC had finished, I needed to assess what I wanted to do. And banking really didn't strike my fancy. And I looked back at our family and my great aunt had been a upper math teacher for 40 years. And my mom had been a home ec teacher for 30 years. And I liked the high school age group. I liked the school calendar. I liked the variety of subjects that a business teacher could teach. So I went back to my degree, added a teaching certificate. And the first year after that, I taught adult ed for the local community three nights a week. And then I was getting the placement bulletin from my university and there was a job interview schedule. And so I signed up and out walked my ninth grade principal to interview me. And so we caught up in everything and he had moved up here to Alaska and was the new superintendent of the lower Yukon school district. And so we chatted about that and he hired me and about a month later, I packed up and got on a plane and flew to Anchorage and did all of my shopping for a year and flew out to the village. It was only about 750 people, mostly Yupik Eskimo. The K-12 school was only about 250 students. And there were only five teachers in the entire high school. Oh my, so that meant you had to cover several subjects. I did. I started out teaching a lot of business subjects. And over the years, when there were cutbacks and the staff was cut down to four, and we had to kind of rearrange, I ended up teaching four social studies. I did yearbook. I did Spanish. I'm trying to think, it was a little bit of everything. And in a small school like that, you volunteer for almost everything as well. I organized the basketball tourney at our village a couple of times, once for the boys, once for the girls. Volleyball tourney one year. You're just a little bit of everything when you're out there. Mm-hmm. We talked a little bit about you moving from Michigan and how you got to Alaska. Can you tell me how you got over to Anchorage then? Well, it was back in the day of early computers and modems and dial-up connections and chat rooms. And I met my future husband in an AOL chat room. So we chatted online for a couple months. Then we started talking on the phone, and that was in the days before cell phones, so long-distance phone calls. Then eventually I went into town so we could meet face to face. And then I taught for another year and a half out in the village before I decided to make the move into town and substitute taught for a year and worked out at the FedEx building and then got a call for the job up at Palmer High School. I was there for 18 years teaching pretty much just business subjects for that time. And the last seven or so years, I did teach yearbook as well. That must have been a big change from a small school to Palmer. It was. Uh, it was a very big change because I really, really did like the village. Uh, I liked the small size. I liked the different culture, everything that I was learning because I was going to their Eskimo dances, and I was learning how to skin sew from several of the elder ladies in the village. And we would go out walking on the tundra and picking berries and all of that. So it was a very exciting time. But at the same time, you never know what life will throw at you. And when you meet somebody special, you take advantage of that. And so I went from a high school of about 37 to 50 students to a high school 
of a little over 800. So it was quite the big change, but it was was a good challenge. And all my experiences over the years there are just really special with all the people I met and the different things that I got involved with through my subject matter. You probably remember in the days of FHA and VICA and all that sort of stuff. Well, I was the advisor for the Business Professionals of America. So I was involved with students both on the local, state, and national level with that as well. It's a lot of responsibility. There were some very long days. Is there anything else you wanted to share with us about your family? Most of my family is all back in Michigan, but All of my close family now is here, our son and daughter and daughter-in-law and our three grandkids. So I'm pretty much an Alaska transplant for good now. Talking about Alaska, I have to ask you how you adjusted to the long days and long nights. I think in some ways, the long days are almost harder than the long nights. Just because your body, to me, doesn't really adjust to the long light as well. It's just very hard to go to sleep. Your body's saying, well, it's still light out. Stay awake. So I put blackout fabric on the back of the drapes in the bedroom at night, which helps. In the winter, the hard part is that you're just getting going in the afternoon and the sun starts setting about 2.30. So it can be a real damper on the day. But at the same time, being inside and lights and being busy with crafts and other things is what helps me personally get through the long nights, the short days in the winter. And even though you were from a northern state in the lower states, being up in Alaska, is that a lot colder or was it not too bad of a difference? Well... What people need to remember is that Alaska basically has all five climatic zones. We actually have a desert. Even though it's cold, it's very dry. We have the rainforest in the southeast. We have the continental in the Anchorage area. What I like about it up here versus Michigan is that where we lived, it was very humid, especially in the winter When the storms come across the states and over Lake Michigan, and they pick up a lot of moisture, and that makes the winter cold very damp. Whereas here in Anchorage, in the Eagle River area, and out on the Yukon Delta, it was very much more of a dry cold. So while it was really cold, and we had to worry about frostbite and things like that, it was not damp cold, which is what really bothered me back in Michigan. So to me, it's been an easy adjustment from that aspect. Interesting. Thanks for sharing that. If you had the opportunity to tell generations in the future something about yourself, what would you like them to know? I think it would be that that I learned to believe in myself to step out and take chances and try things. And I learned a lot to not be as fearful of things. I was very family-centered when I was in Michigan, and it was a huge step to move away like I did. Moving to the village and having to be very independent and problem-solve in a very small place with not many resources, no roads where you could only fly in and out to get there, really brought out my independence. And I learned that I could do a whole lot of things that I didn't think I could. And I've really become the person that I am because of that chance I took. And I think what I'd want young people to remember is be brave, take that chance. Mm hmm. It's hard to step out of our comfort zones. Very much so. It struck me when you were talking before that when you moved up there, 
you had to shop for a year. How did you know what to shop for? Well, the first semester, the first half a year was probably the most difficult because I didn't know anybody. The new superintendent didn't really have a lot of resources to pass on. So I didn't really have anybody to talk to. So it was pretty much a guess. You kind of think, think about your eating habits, think about your daily habits, all of those. It was pretty much just an educated guess. And after that, when I flew out at Christmas to go back to Michigan to see family and then flew back through, back out at the end of Christmas break, I did stop at the stores and stock up on a few things that I was running low on and boxed them up and mailed them out. And then the next year, I had a really good friend, another fellow teacher, and she and I shared thoughts and ideas and rented a car together in August when we did our preschool year shopping and so forth and just kind of honed it down and learned how much of different things you eat over the year and how much toothpaste do you use and just all those you know little things you don't even think about. There were two stores in the village, but things were really super expensive, uh, especially things that were heavy and things that were needing to be cold and frozen. And so you really relied on a lot of dry goods although there were ways to ship frozen out there, which is a little more expensive. But it was just a big learning curve that we navigated through. There's always details that we just don't know are coming up. Right. Besides quilting, are there other crafts that you do or have done? And at this point, let's do also besides your cross-stitch, because we'll want to talk about your cross-stitch after any other hobbies? Way back, back to Grandma Soul again. And in the early days, like in third grade or so, it was a cold, rainy day in the summer. And us kids were antsy and Grandma pulled out the old iron-on patterns and her blue cookie tin with the floss. And I learned how to do basic embroidery stitches and did that here and there, mostly when I was at Grandma's. So that was kind of the beginning there. And then in junior high, with mom as a home ec teacher, I'd already learned how to sew on my own buttons and stuff if one fell off a shirt, because that was just what needed to be done and how she believed in doing things. And that was also the era in the early 70s of those kits where you could buy to make a fanny pack or a backpack. And I made a set of gaiters. And then in high school, Mom bought some fabric and a pattern and said, here, you're going to make a couple dress shirts. Okay. So I made a couple dress shirts. So that was kind of basic sewing that I learned over the years. Lately, besides my quilting and cross-stitching, I've continued the embroidery, but I've also kind of branched out into... I kind of divide things now between my quilting and cross-stitching and the more conventional. And then the part of me that's kind of a fabric or a textile artist a little bit as well. And I'd seen a design on a blog. And two years ago, in the midst of the pandemic, I pretty much finished it. But I made a fabric book. And I just finished another one as well. And where I embroidered verses on one side of the page and then I either appliqued or quilted or embroidered or beaded or something on the other side of the page and just kind of explored different things, my abilities, my interests in a little different fashion. And so each page was about eight and a half by five. And then I did another one that was about a note card size, three by five. That's the one I just finished. And I've got a full size one that I am on the side kind of making now. So again, it's kind of exploring more of a different side of being an artist in some senses. What a unique way to put that together. It 
was a real labor of love because I'd been saving poems and texts over several years. And in the first book, I chose 16. And so I had 16 verses and 16 designs. And then in the new one, that was just four and four. And the last one will be four and four as well. So it's kind of an expression in some ways of me and what's important to me, what words have been important to me, and what designs have struck me as interesting, beautiful, unique. I'm a little curious as I'm looking at a few of the things you've done that were on your Facebook page. I'm looking at a winter and spring that you embroidered, and then it looks like you quilted. Were those part of the books? No, they were not. Those are through Crab Apple Hill Studio. There were the four seasons, and she had made them into pillows. I decided to make them into small quilted wall hangings so that I could change them out with the seasons. You did an amazing job with those. Thank you. Stephen, are there other hobbies that you have? Well, I kind of help out with things. My husband is really into gardening and flowers. He's a retired research forester for the Department of Agriculture. And so I kind of help out with him. He's the green thumb. I'm the assistant to the green thumb. But I do, you know, my background from mom learning how to cook, clean, sew with a mom as a home ec teacher. I like to try cooking different things, different ethnic foods and so forth. I'm really into Thai food, so I enjoy cooking that quite a bit. I enjoy trying different types of bread with uh, different flavors, stronger flavors. So those are kind of the two little side things that I do. I'm not really dedicated like my quilting, but they are very enjoyable to me. My question usually is, do your crafts or hobbies show up in your quilting? And we've talked a little bit about how some of these other things do show up in your quilting. Can you describe that a little bit more for us? Sure. In one of the pages in my fabric book, there was a Shakespeare quote and We always think of Shakespeare lots of time and the uh, Beatles song, the Parsley Sage, Rosemary and Time. And so the picture side of the page, I embroidered those herbs and I learned some different techniques of combining different color threads for a different shading in, in the leaves as I embroidered them. In quilts that I've made for other friends and so forth, I've appliqued leaves on them. The retirement quilt that I made for my husband, it's all different leaves that I traced and in hand embroidered and then hand applique and then enhanced with embroidery. Or in some cases, like I made the acorns out of ultra suede and the sumac bush, I used beads for the berries, things like that. So I've incorporated other things in doing a lot of the nature aspect in some of my quilts. I'm wondering if I'm looking at the one quilt that you just mentioned for your husband. Did it have nine blocks in it? No, the nine block one was where I kind of stepped out of the usual as well. That was a Baltimore book that I had. And I picked nine blocks there that I wanted to do. And my little spin on it, instead of using traditional old looking reds and greens, I used all batiks in it. And then for the berries, I used red ultra suede. The quilt that I made for my husband has a yellow background and there's a lot of half square triangle borders between the yellow blocks. and. It has the big U.S. Forest Service patch on it. Okay. Well, from what I'm seeing, you do an amazing job with applique. Thank you. It's one of the things that 
I really enjoy a lot. I am quite good at it. Everyone has their own little unique spot where they can excel. And it just is sort of a natural thing for me to be able to do needle turn applique. And it's been rewarding in the aspect that the quilts that I have entered in the state fair, lots of comments from the judges over the years have mentioned the fineness of my needle turn and that they cannot see the stitches. And so it's rewarding to get that feedback like that when you think that you're good at it, but then that you actually get comments and ribbons because you find out you are. It looks wonderful. Did I understand that cross stitch is fairly new to you? It is. I had done just some basic line that made these little boxes and letters with some charms, some little kits that I had seen, oh goodness, 15 years ago. And then about five years ago, my sister and I had run across a kit, not really a kit, but just a design that my mom had started because we needed to put her in a home because of her dementia. And we were clearing out cabinets and her sewing room and elsewhere. And we ran across this cross stitch that she had started back in the mid 80s that was to go with the China dolls that my mom and grandma had made for her of the little women figures. And my sister didn't like to do cross stitch anymore. So she handed it to me and said, here, you finish it. And I had never really done extensive cross stitch. So I brought it up here and it sat in the drawer for a couple of years. And about two, two and a half years ago, just before the pandemic, I dug it out and had to rip out some and kind of assess where it was at. And it was an extensive project. It was 18 count. There was no real definite border to it. A lot of counting to make sure placement of things and circling up around counterclockwise and things were supposed to match because of some of mom's mistakes and probably a couple of mine. I was just a couple stitches off, but it was with tendrils and stuff. So it really doesn't show, but it was such a sense of accomplishment of finishing that and doing the back stitching, which really makes everything pop as far as the design it was an extreme challenge, but I really enjoyed doing it. And that was what led to buying the kit of the maple leaf camping scene that I saw. And I have several other patterns that I have purchased, and they are in my to-do bin downstairs. And I tend to try to save those for more of my winter projects when I'm sitting watching Jeopardy and things like that. And it's things that I can just listen to. And I've got my frame that sits over my lap and I can just relax for an hour, hour and a half and stitch away. Yeah, that's when I started cross-stitching was because it was something a little easier to pick up and set down. Right. But at the same time, I just always need some sort of a handwork project. And while that is a, like you mentioned, is a project that can be set down and picked up quickly and easily, I usually also have some sort of quilting piecing handwork that I can pop in a bag and take with me, whether it's on planes, on vacation, when I'm waiting for somebody in a doctor's appointment or even just at home for something different to work on. So I have a lot of handwork, non-cross-stitching as well. Nice. Who introduced you to quilting? It was mom and I. In the late 70s, in the Good Housekeeping magazine, there was a pattern. And of all the patterns for them to put in the magazine, it was a storm at sea pattern. It was about a yard square, and that was in the days of when you cut out the cardboard templates, you traced them on the fabric, you cut them out with scissors, and so forth. 
And little did we know how exact and important doing that was with those odd-shaped triangles. And it was a real challenge and a lot of frustration. Somehow, we didn't kill each other, and we got the top finished. And we set it aside, and we said, oh my God, never again. Then about five years later, out came rotary cutters and rulers and mats. And it was like, oh, wow, this is interesting. And so mom started up again. I was in the middle of college at that time, but I would see what she was up to and would help her a little bit every now and then. And when I got my first apartment, I borrowed my sister's sewing machine and ended up making my first sampler quilt, all blue and white with alternating blocks of plain white and the sampler. And from there, it just continued on. And I thought you were going to say you went ahead and did another storm at sea once the rotary cutter came out. No. (laughs) (laughs) Whether it's a quilt you made or someone else made, do you have a favorite quilt? Oh, my. You know, lots of times the favorite one is the one I'm working on. But I must say that often my favorite ones are the ones that I have somewhat designed from scratch, where I can kind of be creative, where there's traditional piecing. I might work in a machine embroidery on it somewhere or not. I might have applique blocks. I enjoy that creative process. So I've never really had a favorite one per se. There's favorite parts of quilts that I've really enjoyed and favorite and interesting techniques that I've tried that I've liked or ones that I've learned to not like. And so I think it's just the exploration, which is a favorite thing of mine. And I think if you ask my husband, he would say that I didn't really have a favorite either because right now I have like a dozen or more different quilts, embroidery, cross-stitch things going at the same time. And I find that what I need to do is sometimes set something aside when I'm stumped or I'm starting to hurry and I don't like the quality of my work degrading. So I go to another one. So my favorite always seems to keep shifting. That's great that you have something else available to you that you know that's how you like to work. And on your quilts, what tool are you so happy that you have to use? I think upgrading my sewing machines has been hugely beneficial. I mean, I started out with my little old Singer that I bought back in Michigan that first Christmas, because I told mom, oh my gosh, I need some filler time out in the village. And I mailed that up here. And then later I came back and said, I've improved. I need a better sewing machine. And I bought my Viking Lily. And then when she got a new Viking, then I bought her D1 and was embroidering and all of that. So the upgrading of my machines has been huge. And then I think the next thing, it's so simple. And I used to always think it was kind of hokey, but everybody talks about the purple fang as being a real life-changing tool in some ways. So I went out and bought one when I was doing the Judy Niemeyer quilt. And while I had a stiletto, a couple of them, they just didn't quite work as good. And being able to use that new tool in holding things in place way beyond just that Judy Niemeyer quilt has been amazing and changing there. And just the different techniques that I can do with my sewing machine, I think of my sewing machine as a tool as well. That's good to know because I just bought my first purple thing. 
the flatness. I guess I didn't really notice that when people would talk about it. But when I got it home and took it out, I noticed that that point was flat. It helps smooth little things out and tuck in that little bit of width. And it just made life a lot easier and made the sewing process enjoyable and not frustrating. I'm looking forward to that because I haven't had a chance to use it yet. I'm looking at a quilt you did. I don't even know what you call this. It's some type of compass type block that you put together and there's 16 blocks on it. It's just amazing. I'm having trouble remembering what that one is. How do I explain it? It looks like it should be circles, but you have them overlapping and there's points. So I think of a mariner's oh. compass, but it's not. Is it all purples and greens? Mm-hmm. Okay, that's a Judy Niemeyer pattern that I got probably, oh goodness, 15 or so years ago. Bert and I were in Sevierville and Pigeon Forge. We switched our timeshare there one year. And there happened to be a quilt show when we went in. And the original pattern was in more fall colors, browns and golds and things like that. But the vendor at the booth had done it in purples and greens, which was, you know, really beautiful. And the pattern was like 40 bucks or something. And I passed on by, well, and was looking at things. And then Bert came along and said, here, happy early birthday. (laughs) And so then I looked at it later and it's like, oh, I'll get to it. And I never got to it till after I was retired. And then it was pretty daunting. But I don't do curves, but I sure learned how to do them. I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. It's beautiful. Thanks. Yeah. While we're on this subject, describe the quilt. There's three sections to each unit. And they're done in quarters. And that inner quarter is the one that really has the points and the stars. And so paper piecing is such a definite technique for doing those sharp points. And that's what Judy Niemeyer is known for. And then the next ring is flying geese on an arc. And again, because of the different shapes and so forth, paper piecing made all the difference. And then the outer section that completes that quarter square has some very fine points and is kind of a pointed star again. Then you have to sew all those curves together. And that was a real challenge because I have pretty much avoided sewing machine curves my entire life because I find them frustrating and just I didn't think that I did them well at all. And a friend on the Facebook group is a certified instructor for the Niemeyer quilts and she sent me some videos and how-tos and the purple thing and lots of pinning and fabric glue just to kind of hold things generally in place made a big difference. And it was just pretty much a big moment when it was like, wow, these aren't as bad as I thought. And while I still don't really like them, I have confidence in doing them now. And then just to see the variety of colors that I used from the purples to the greens and just doing things very randomly. It's just so nice and bright. And we decided to hang it on the entry wall. So it shows up real nice on the white wall. It's a good contrast and it's just been exciting. And the borders, uh, I'm going to call them borders. There's not really extra border on there, but there's hills and valleys. It's not like it's straight. So how hard was that to bind? That was difficult. I have done a needle turn knife edge on a hexagon edged quilt before, which was its own challenge. But that's tucking in and a little bit here and there and snipping and so forth. But this one was curved 
all the way around. So definitely had to cut the binding on the bias. And then the inner corners are way different than outer corners and had to do a lot of fiddling with those. And some were very successful and some not so much. So I think that's probably my biggest disappointment on that quilt is the binding in those inner corners. It was just a real big challenge. Well, I'm sure we're all going to want to go look at that because it looks perfect to me. Thank you. On the quilting process, do you like each step along the way or do you look forward to one step particularly? Each step to me is a little different and it kind of depends on the quilt that I'm on. This winter, I spent a lot of time doing a lot of prep work. I think I got the inspiration from that Judy Niemeyer quilt where you have to really stay organized and you do all of your cutting and binder clips and baggies that are labeled. And so this winter, I last fall mostly, but I did a lot of prep work where I did cutting. I had big bags where I included the thread and the pattern and the backing and had everything ready to go. And so then over the winter, I was able to pretty much just sew, which was kind of nice. And yet at the same time, one of those that I couldn't prep a whole lot was, and I'm going to say this wrong, a Millie Fiori, however you say that word, quilt, that's all hexagons that I'm currently working on still. That was kind of fun because I really could root through my stash of fabric and get a lot of different colors and really have a explosion of colors. And so that has been really fun. I don't fussy cut. I've never enjoyed that, but I enjoy playing with the colors. I think that binding is okay. It's exciting because I'm getting to the end, but I don't like to do the, the four corners. So when I'm doing my bindings, I always tend to go through and flip and turn and do the four corners first. And then I just have the straight edges left when I'm getting towards the end. The quilting, I've hand quilted some small items, but I tend to machine quilt most of the smaller projects. I am not a good freehand quilter. That's just a skill that I don't really have. I do a lot of edge to edge and there's a lady in town that I go to and rent her machine for a couple hours. Have a couple. I finished uh, one through the Crab Apple Hill, and I'd like that one to be a little custom quilted. So I'll probably go to a different place for that. And then this Millefiore that I'm doing, that is one that I think I really would like to have someone have a real fun time quilting and enhancing what I have done. And I'll probably head into her here in the next couple months and say, what do you think? You want the challenge. <laughs> Tell about your worst quilting experience. Oh, goodness. I do remember, yes. Mom and I did this one quilt one year. We used to have a quilt store and they had a block of the month. And so I would always buy that for mom for her birthday and send it off to her each month. And we started out this one year. And to begin with, the one neutral fabric, you couldn't really tell. It was not a batik, but you could not really tell what the front and back of this splotchy, whitish gray fabric was. So that was the first problem. And then the first six months was all templates and cutting them out and so forth. And then for whatever reason, they decided for the last six months that they were going to go to rotary cut directions. So you can imagine that all of a sudden, the blocks of the first six months were not the same size as the second six months. And then they had these kits that they offered for you to buy to put them together and they had designed it. Well, it was only to put six of the blocks together and it was 45 bucks. If you wanted to put the other six together, it would be another kit. 
And I somehow managed to get them all together using one finishing kit and told mom about it. And we got it. And then we had to buy some fabric for sashing. And I had chosen a bright orange for mine. And her and dad chose a green for theirs. And we used those papers to do all the half square triangles and made good tracks on that. And when we got it done, we don't usually name our quilts, but boy, we came up with a name for that one real quick. And we said that was the quilt from hell. So you didn't try to use that pattern again, did you? No, we didn't. Partly because it was hard to keep track of all those paper pieces for the first six months, even though we had the rotary cut direction sheets from the second. But it turned out okay, but not one that we made again. Do you know why you make quilts rather than spend your time doing something else? Well, I've always kind of been different. Uh, in, in what I do, what I like. And it was just the real tactile aspect of handling the fabric and needle in hand uh, is just very calming, very comforting. That's kind of why after we're done with supper, we sit down to watch Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune, as crazy as that may sound, because it's an hour that we both just sit there and aren't running around trying to get something done, crossed off a list. Before bedtime, sometimes if I'm really wound up and stressed, that needle in hand really calms me. I've enjoyed woodworking, but I'm not good at it. When I used to work with my late dad on woodworking projects, I kind of always equated myself as being the surgical nurse to his woodworking because I understood what he was trying to do, where he was headed next, what tool he probably needed. And we just were a real good team working together in that way while he made it because he was a very fine woodworker, but it was not something that interested me as far as being my hobby to do. I just find dealing with textile very encouraging, very soothing, very positive. What great memories you must have being able to work with your dad like that. It was good. It was really good. Yeah, we made several things for our cottage. He made us a small entertainment center and end tables for our couch and chair. And then he and I later together made a bookshelf and There were other things that I helped him with that he'd made for my sisters and things like that. So, yeah, real good. Mm -hmm. Who do you usually make your quilts for? Well, for the most part, it's family. You know, I've made baby quilts modeled after one that my grandmother had made for all of her grandkids, for our three grandkids. And I have made quilts for our son and daughter's uh, graduations and for Bert's retirement. I've made several quilts for not necessarily full-size quilts, more of one for hanging on the wall for uh, several friends that I used to teach with as they've retired. I have quite a stack that's just in the corner of the living room, just ones that we pull out whenever to use or when they get grandkids are over to snuggle up in or so I have quite a pile there. I've never sold any and I never will. I make them and make them for who I want to when something comes along. If it's somebody that is special to me, has impacted me somehow in a positive way that I want to gift something that is from me, that has taken time from me. Mm-hmm. The other thing that I've started, it goes back to my grandma and goes back to her crafting and teaching me to embroider and so forth is that for about 15 years, she used to make all of us grandkids a Christmas ornament too. 
And I started doing that for our grandkids and a very special couple of us are our friends' grandkids as well. I've had so much fun with them that I planned on 20 designs for 20 years and I'm finishing up the last year right now. So I got Christmas ornaments for our grandkids in packages labeled with the year out to like 2037. What a cool idea. I was just thinking that you would make them each year that came along, but how cool to have that already. It's been fun. Tried a few techniques and new things there along the way as well. And like I said, I just had so much fun with them that I just kept going. The idea was, yeah, make one a year like grandma did. But off I went. That is so neat. Stephen, is there something you're working on right now? There's a couple different things. Yeah. No cross stitch at the moment, although I do have one that I'll probably prep over the summer for come fall. I'm working on the Millifiori, which is all hexagons. And each of those hexagons can be anywhere from three pieces to up to a dozen or more pieces. They're about, uh, I think, the point to point, they're about five and a half inches. The entire quilt, when it's done, will be about 90 inches square. It's all turned around paper templates and sewn by hand. So that's my current craziness. I have a small grapevine wreath that's like a Baltimore quilt that I had started 20 years ago that I found when I was cleaning out my sewing room last year. And I'm hand quilting that. And I just about have that done. It's about 14 inches square. And I've got my pages of text that I'm embroidering for my next fabric book. I have... Another Crab Apple Hill quilt that has blocks and embroidery sections. I started embroidering those about three weeks ago. I've got a quilt that I had planned to get out this winter and work on again. It harkens back to my days in the village. I started it in about 1996. It's a big Eskimo themed scene that I am working on and gathering some more fabrics and ideas on. So I think that that's going to be this next winter's big project. I have a bunch of fat quarters that I had kept and they were just sitting there and I decided I needed to use them. And I know that it's an old pattern that some people are tired of, but the yellow brick road. And I took those and I've got 14 baby size quilts that I need to go and get quilted and get bound. So that's kind of where I'm at at the moment. Sounds like you're going to be busy for a while. Never, never at a loss, that is for sure. And then I have some things going on with my embroidery part of my machine as well. So I tend to jump around, which seems a little scattered sometimes, but it's kind of my personality, kind of need things to be changed up a little bit. Mm-hmm. Describe your sewing space. Oh, goodness. So I kind of have two spaces. One of our old bedrooms upstairs is basically our computer room where both my husband and I have our computers. And I have a little desk over in the corner, which is sometimes where I can kind of do a little bit of more crafty side of some of my work or where I might do some of my beading on certain projects. It's where I keep my embroidery floss and all of that sort of stuff, some basic tools. I have one of those old little tool chests with the felt line drawers. That's kind of my little workstation there. Downstairs. In the spare bedroom down there, I have a cabinet that used to be in the kitchen before we remodeled, and that's now where I store all of my thread and blanks for embroidery and my stabilizer and all that sort of stuff. And between that and the wall, I have a little three-foot folding table 
And that's where my sewing machine is. And depending on what I'm working on, I have my fold out table that I put up. And so I'm kind of like sandwiched in between my sewing machine and that fold up table under which I store my bins of fabric and projects. So I sort of have a dedicated area, but it's not real big. We're talking about doing some changing and things downstairs, which if that happens, the futon in the bedroom downstairs will come out and I will have that whole room for my sewing area. But who knows how that will progress. So sometimes when I really have a big project, and this is what's the crazy thing, when we redid the kitchen, the new island counter is big enough for that really huge roll-up cutting mat. So if I have some big things to cut, then I clear the counter and go at it right there in the kitchen. That's usually a pretty good height to cut too. It is. And when we redid it, we really liked the light that we already had and we kept the bright lights. And so which we can dim, but when I'm cutting, I can turn that switch all the way up and have landing lights for the airplanes if I want. Makes it really great. Share a quilting tip. Well, I don't know if it'd really be a tip, but one of the things that I've started doing, sometimes it's finished projects, whether it's some of my cross-stitching or those embroideries for the, my Crab Apple Hill design or whatever. What I've started doing instead of just folding them up and putting them in a box is that I have taken the cardboard from the center of the aluminum foil or saran wrap, or in the case when I need a bigger one from wrapping paper, and I have been rolling those items onto that so that they don't get creases from sitting in a box for so long. And then I usually have some like flower cloth sack towels. I roll it in that as well to keep the dust and dirt off. And then I can just set that on the shelf in the closet or whatever. And they're not folded, but they're rolled. And it's much easier to press and not have to worry about permanent creases. What a great idea. Now, had you seen that somewhere or you just came up with it? I just came up with it because I had these four other cross stitches that I had done and they were just kind of laid on top of my dresser and they were getting dusty and they were kind of stiff and so forth and where to store them and so forth. And I just decided, oh, and it just came to me that I could roll them because rather than fold them because of the stitching and everything, I didn't want to mess up right down the middle of them. And so I just said, roll them because I got the idea from, I guess, from when you're rolling posters and things like that. Yeah, cool. I wanted to let everybody know that you can go to aquilterslife.com and check out Stephen Cook's page and you'll be able to see his wonderful projects. Sounds exciting. Stephen, is there anything else you wanted to share with us? I think it's just enjoy. Just enjoy the process. Enjoy the excitement. Share with others. Be happy. Life is short and embrace it all. And try new things. The worst that can happen is that the technique doesn't work for you. It may work for you and maybe something you really like, but you don't know if you don't try it. And we learn, always keep learning. I guess that's the teacher in me. After 26 years of teaching, I said the same thing to my students, whether it be using their software or whatever, just always try, see if it works. Be experimental, be, be brave. Mm -hmm. 
Well, Stephen, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today on A Quilter's Life. I so enjoyed hearing it and spending this time with you. Thank you so much. It's been fun. It's been a new experience for me, having been interviewed by newspapers and others before. This is my first podcast. Oh, great. Bye-bye. Goodbye. You can find more stories on aquilterslife.com or subscribe on your favorite podcast player so each episode will be downloaded automatically. Also, I want to hear about you and your wonderful quilts. Please contact me, Paula Chamberlain, through the website to set up an interview. And as always, thanks for listening. <music>